I know it's been a long day. Um, we have a great lineup uh, to give you a great perspective on healthcare, uh, the investment opportunities and where those opportunities exist as well as the challenges. And um, as a means of background, I'm the, my name is James Matthews and I'm the chairman of Health 2.0 India, um, CEO of Whiteboard Design and we are, we have the largest network of healthcare entrepreneurs and corporates in the world uh, congregating in networks, um, at conferences, at events, at incubators, trying to figure out how to transform healthcare with newer technologies and services. Um, and uh, today we have a really great and varied panel with us. Uh, we want to take a different approach to the panel um, today, and I'm just going to get started by making one comment. You've, you've heard a lot throughout the day, and in other conferences, uh, the opportunities, where are the opportunities to invest? So we know e-commerce, travel, all those uh, venues. And healthcare always seems to be a destination. Uh, when I talk to investors, uh, the first thing they say is, listen, I'll, the things I won't invest in is healthcare and education. And that's good if you're looking for short term um, and midterm. Um, but healthcare, there's real opportunity in healthcare. Billions are being invested in services as well as technology side, both on the corporate side, on the services side, and the startup world. And it's good if you pay attention, especially if you have a long term point of view. So uh, we have some folks here that are going to help tease out that story and help you understand that opportunity. And um, they're sitting here, they were introduced before but I'll introduce him real quick. Dr. Rohit Sane uh, is a physician who decided to break away from traditional medicine, integrate what he learned as, as an MBBS doctor into uh, the ancient art or science of, of Ayurveda medicine, runs 137 clinics in Maharashtra with two hospitals with the specific focus on cardiology care. Um, uh, uh, KC, uh, K. Chandrasekhar is a, a founder and CEO of Forest Health. They're building medical equipment and medical devices uh, in one area that actually helps prevent needless blindness, which is a big problem in the country. And they have other uh, product lines as well. And the unique factor about their uh, product line is they're trying to put devices in the hands of people who normally aren't in charge of the, of the patient's care, non-physicians, uh, which is making a huge difference. Dr. Ramesh Babu is the founder of uh, Medwin Hospitals and now he is a venture capitalist with Venture East, has great perspective being in the healthcare industry for a long, long time, um, and is now sitting uh, in a seat where he's directing investments into uh, the opportunities that I mentioned before. So it's gonna be great to hear from him. And then uh, Saurav Pande has, Panda has uh, helped start uh, an organization called Sparsh Nephrocare, uh, which is uh, meeting the needs of the growing uh, problem we have uh, in India around diabetes that leads to uh, kidney failure. So they're uh, bringing dialysis care to the patient and we're going to be able to see and hear from him how he's actually disrupting that market and even the idea and concept around what it means to deliver care to the patient beyond the hospital. Um, before we start, I wanted you all to hear uh, from all the panelists uh, in the first few minutes. So I had a question for them. Uh, we have all kinds of backgrounds here uh, in the auditorium uh, from different business verticals and you may or may not be interested in healthcare, but we're going to ask you to give us some time here to help you understand why healthcare is a good destination in terms of opportunity and investment. And so the question I have, I'll ask this, um, and we can, I'll start with, with you, Dr. Ramesh, is um, why invest in healthcare or why not invest in healthcare? Why is it given, why do people, like I said before, kind of brush it off and why are you looking at those opportunities? Can you give us your point of view on that real quick? Some wearable devices to healthcare analytics and all in all, but one thing which comes off uh, in most of the reports, uh, opportunity meets promise in India. I'm just trying to understand what opportunity meets promise in India, and then trying to understand all the big companies in India in the last healthcare in the last uh, 20, 30 years. 
Sun Pharmaceuticals, probably the top 10 Indian companies, not just for my entire country, was not there 30 years ago. Hmm. Ready Labs was not there 25 years ago. Shanta Biotech was not there 20 years ago. Bharat Biotech was not there 15 years ago. Apollo Health Chain was not there 25 years ago. Fortis was not there uh, 15 years ago. Sparsh was not there maybe five years ago. Nephroplus was not there five years ago. All the businesses, what we see today, so-called healthcare. So normally when people think of opportunities in healthcare, if you're looking for something like a Flipkart or a Ola Caps or a Uber, don't come to healthcare. Yeah. But if you want to build a sustainable business, you're patient enough to build for the next one to two decades, I don't think there's any greater opportunity than healthcare in this country. So it's a kind of investment my grandfather or my parents would invest in, right? Healthcare. That's the way we need to look at it, right? That's what, that's what I say. I know we're laughing, but we're laughing because we know they're right, right? <laughs> Um, Casey, you've been a beneficiary of uh, investment capital. Can you talk a bit, a little bit about that and answer the same question? Why healthcare? Why not healthcare? Because you're in the middle of it. You know what the opportunity is, but you know the wall that you run up against also. Flip cards of the world are there. But what I basically believe, especially with the medical devices space, um, it's not very easy. Uh, if you are actually doing services, um, or doing services predominantly now home care is becoming more and more popular a uh, lot of focus is there because people see uh, you know billion people and those numbers which is again attached to flip cards or anybody of the world so there are opportunity if you are providing services the limitation for that is uh, you know there you need technicians you need uh, paramedics you need so skilled manpower becomes a bottleneck so there would be only five, six, eight organizations who will scale. So they'll they'll basically get funded. But medical devices, fortunately, uh, I'm not taking the wearable ones, but the traditional medical devices, they probably you know uh, were not very popular at least for the last ten years. It was not the darling of. Uh, so typically in investment cycle, there is a flavor of the month or flavor of the right. season. Uh, medical devices is not the flavor of the season uh, traditionally. But uh, very recently I was there in San Francisco and there seems to be a mood which is slowly coming in favor of medical devices. But then for it to come to India and you know start working probably will take some more time. So that's, that's pretty and it's very difficult especially in the med devices space not very easy to uh, get investment. Mm. And somebody who is trying to fuse uh, modern with ancient, Dr. Rohit, Go take a stab at answering that question. Why healthcare and uh, why not? According to me, uh, healthcare is always a good uh, option to invest in. There is a good amount of resistance from uh, n number of uh, stakeholders. Uh, it becomes a difficult uh, decision for the investor to uh, be inside. But yes, as what uh, Ramesh Babu said, ki yes, if at all we are looking for a long term type of investment, a decade or two, 101% it's a great place to invest in. Yeah. That's my look out. And uh, Swara, uh, it's a terrible thing that's happening in India, the rise of diabetes and these diseases that are affecting uh, uh, renal systems and lead to more and more uh, significant rise in people needing dialysis. Um, but it, it simultaneously it provides a great opportunity, a business opportunity, as well as opportunity to provide care where it didn't exist before. Um, which, how would you, how, how do you answer the question, healthcare or not healthcare? You know, alluding to what you just said, uh, I was talking to one of my friends who works in a VC fund and he was saying he was writing a report on the Indian healthcare sector and he says that uh, people eat bad, bad eating habits, high blood pressure, a lot of diabetes and there was a whole section on that and it ended with India is great for healthcare. So as you said, it's terrible that this is increasing but from, uh, you know, when you look at, uh, at it from an entrepreneur's perspective, it's an opportunity. Alluding to what Casey just mentioned a little bit uh, earlier that uh, services is one sector where he feels devices is not the flavor of the season of services is, but the problems are, as he rightly pointed out, uh, uh, semi-skilled labor is, uh, finding semi-skilled labor in India is very tough. Mm -hmm. But the thing is, where there is a problem only then you have an opportunity to solve it. If there's no problem, you're not solving it. And uh, from my perspective, I feel the one number that 
we all should look at when investing in healthcare in India, if the question comes up is, uh, we have a population of 130 crores. I think that's the number you look at. The more the number of people, the more chances are that there are problems that you have to solve. And that's why, as an entrepreneur, you get uh, actually a lot of opportunities to solve a lot of problems. And hence, it's a great sector to invest in. Uh, probably except Apollo. Chennai, there's no corporate hospital in the country. And Hyderabad, Apollo came and Medwin came. 87, 88. I think at that time, uh, probably the biggest hospital in the private sector in Andhra Pradesh must be a 30-bed hospital. So we came up with a 200-bed hospital. Apollo came up with a 300-bed hospital. What I've seen in the last 20 years, the journey of healthcare delivery, it started 20, 30 years, it's all multi-speciality, Jane's 200-bed, 300-bed hospitals. Later, maybe 15 years ago, started the single-speciality hospitals, heart centers, ophthalmology chains, dental chains, uh, people felt uh, it's far more easy to manage those single specialty hospitals. Uh, entrepreneurs felt that when investors also pumped in money into single specialty, no more you'll see that kind of large money going into the multi specialty hospitals. The last five to seven years, people are, you see a lot of trends going into niche play, maybe dialysis centers, or maybe primary healthcare centers, uh, or even home health care centers, very specialized areas which were not there. Because after having conquered all the major things, a multi-speciality, I think those small niche areas in health care delivery services, or the Ayurvedic center, these are the ones which are seeing traction of late. So from a multi-speciality hospital to a single specialty hospital to niche service providers, I see more traction both on the investment side as well as the opportunity side. Uh, coming for one more data point regarding what can be the opportunity uh, which partly reflects on the kidney. Uh, I'm sure some of you must have heard the word non-communicable diseases, uh, which used to be called the chronic diseases. Uh, so three, four years back, people came up with the non-communicable diseases. And uh, as doctors, 1975, when I started my medicine, or even as late as 87, when we started cardiology training, at that time, we felt cardiovascular diseases are rare in India. It's a disease of the Western population because they eat oily food, they eat beef. We used to think they get the cardiac problem. In the last 20 years, 20 years is such a short period of time, our entire thinking process has changed. The chronic diseases which comprise cardiovascular diseases, cancers, chronic lung problems and diabetes, four of them put together, they constitute the NCDs. The prevalence in India is twice the prevalence in Western population. If the cardiovascular disease prevalence is 4% in the United States or United Kingdom or Germany, in India it's 10%. If you take all the non-communicable diseases together, it's probably 10% in the Western population and it's 20% in Indian population. And surprisingly, the entire demographics is shifting towards the East. Uh, the Arab countries in Eastern Europe, Asia Pacific, and Russia. The entire the same story. So as the economy is progressing, probably whatever reasons, we eat more, we excise less, and I think we see a demographic shift in the prevalence. So that single factor tells that's a great opportunity, whether it's for healthcare services, whether for medical devices, whether for pharmaceutical products, I think uh, we need uh, whatever we need. We, I think we need more pharmaceutical companies, biotech companies, hospitals. Uh, I think just India is a promise. Uh, but one key, execution is the key. You can screw it up. If you don't do it well, you'll screw it up. First, we have uh, three funds. We have a late stage fund. We're proactive with nothing to do with healthcare. Uh, we have a dedicated life sciences fund, which do one to five million dollars. And where I am part is a very early stage fund called the Venture is Tenet Fund. And that fund is over. We are raising a new fund called the NDIA Fund, E N D I V A. And it will be focused on technology. My partner will be looking after, I'll be looking at the healthcare. To give a flavor of what we have done and what we'll be doing, we funded one company in the medical devices space uh, called the One Breath. Uh, it's a ventilator uh, which we claim will perform as good as a high end ventilator at one-tenth the cost. The high-end ventilator costs anywhere from 
20 to 30 thousand dollars in the western population in probably in western countries in india probably anywhere from 10 to 15 thousand dollars the our company plans to launch this ventilator as low as 2000 to 3000 dollars uh, it is incubated at stanford uh, it's some part of the company is in india some part of the company in the us we hope to get the ce mark in uh, amshesh chandrasekhar is the right person we are anticipating we'll get the ce marking in six to nine months. Uh, so that is the next bottleneck or the, not the bottleneck, the landmark for that company. The other company we, we funded is into healthcare IT space uh, because it's player of the season, everyone wants to dabble. It is into patient engagement. So what we feel is, uh, in fact, Forbes magazine two years back said uh, patient engagement is the next blockbuster drug of the century. What we feel as doctors, once the patient leaves the hospital room, for all practical purposes, uh, there's a disconnect. Uh, the same applies in India, same applies in Western countries. Uh, so it's very, very, it's not easy to get back to your own doctor. So we want to, the smart RX wants to automate as much information as possible uh, and also facilitate a small query is there on e-consultation. So that means uh, instead of being all to everyone, between the doctor and the patient existing, uh, the ecosystem we have, uh, if it is a chronic disease patient, he'll get messages only related to that particular disease he has. He should not be getting junk mails, otherwise it loses the significance on app basically, not an email. And patient, if he has a small doubt, he can just put an e-consultation. That's what we are betting on. It's in a very early stage. So whatever we do, uh, I'll not be funding healthcare services companies because we're not a late stage VC or a private equity. Uh, that's not my passion. We want to spot bright youngsters in small niche areas like this. Uh, yeah. right, and in fact, the ventilator business itself, uh, United States government, uh, there's a tender, not a tender, there's a request uh, proposal. The uh, US government needs 400,000, uh, 400, uh, 4 lakh ventilators, 400k ventilators uh, for emergency stockpiling. Mm -hmm. The specifications they mentioned, the size, the compactness, ability to store, which can work on without on a battery, which you can work on ambient air, not needing uh, compressed air, the existing $20,000, $30,000 cannot perform. So this company was born out of a need that a low cost but fully functional ventilator, and if we succeed, uh, the US government itself needs thousands and thousands of ventilators. Well, I, I want to move on to the entrepreneurs in the room, but I want you to think about a question that I want to answer, you to answer towards the end of the panel which is we've got people in the room, um, investors, we've got MBA students. If you were to give advice to a young person that wants to get into healthcare and start something, what would that be? I want to hear from you later on that. But while we're talking to these entrepreneurs, when you want to ask a question, just feel free to, or, or weigh in an opinion, please do so from your perspective. Okay. I think a, a great segue is to go to Casey and what they're doing um, with Forest Health. Can you explain a little bit about that and then also um, what you've done uh, since being able to uh, raise the funding for your, for, for your business? What, what has been the opportunity you've been able to seize and what is yet to come uh, in the coming years? I think um, Dr. Ramesh Babu rightly said that um, uh, there are huge opportunities uh, given that the disease prevalence is uh, pretty high in a lot of these non-communicable diseases. So we started basically as a company primarily wanting to solve preventable blindness as a, as a mission. So we didn't start as a medical devices company. Medical device was a consequence of understanding what is really required, why there is such a high rate of preventable blindness in India. So when we went down and analyzed, we found that a uh, country like India has only 20,000 ophthalmologists. So which is 1 is to 65,000 ratio for one ophthalmologist is to patients. Second is the cost of equipment was so heavy and people will not like to move it to a rural area. The third was that awareness itself among public was very poor. So they didn't know that if you have diabetes, you will have an eye related problem. So they thought it's fact of life and you know. So that's when we analyzed and came with a device and then since the focus was preventable blindness, a device which can image 
uh, somebody from the community. So that was very important because we also wanted to integrate whatever we are doing with the behavior of the people. For example, if you just screen a person, let's say I come all the way from Delhi and screen somebody in remote Andhra Pradesh and tell him you have a problem, he or she is not going to take it seriously because I don't belong to that community. Whereas if I would have been from the same community, the chances of taking me seriously and going and getting themselves treated is very high. So the, the focus is on getting themselves treated rather than diagnosing. So we wanted to make the equipment very simple that somebody from the community can be trained to actually do it. And then we built certain smart algorithms wherein we want to do preventive care. So automatically when the images are taken without dilation, uh, within two minutes it can actually say, okay, you seem to have a problem or you seem okay. And then the guys who had seemed to have a problem were uploaded on a cloud. And a, an ophthalmologist sitting in Chennai or Delhi or anywhere can actually look at it. You actually uploaded them to the cloud? Yeah, all the images are uploaded on I'm the just cloud. Joking. Yeah, you not them. Cloud. I wish I can do that. We move them and then they get operated and they come back. So it would have been nice. But then it's, it's the uh, images which uh, get uploaded on the cloud and then the ophthalmologist sees it from uh, you know, a remote location and says this patient has to come down immediately because he's got proliferative diabetic retinopathy or uh, glaucoma which needs to be treated immediately. So that's what we have been doing. Well, let me, let me ask you something. So that sounds really good, a big problem. See, I think, um, uh, see, what we did was, one, we started with a mission and with a passion to do a social enterprise, right? But then when we came to business, we were also very clear that we will actually work on three brand pillars, right? One was innovation. Whatever we do, it will be the most innovative thing. And so if there is an innovation panel per se, uh, we would be called as a company. The second thing was focused on investability. In the sense, we would be investable for the sheer, if you remove the innovation part, we remove the social part, we'll still be investable as a business. And that's why we went and raised money from mainstream venture capitalists and not from impact investors because we didn't want to be branded as a... But then the third part obviously is the impact. So uh, investability, impact and innovation, these three brand pillars we play it at 33% each. So we don't overdo something and underdo something. So that's, that's the most important thing. Great. And now you have um, a doctor who was headed one way and then tell us a story about how you went MBBS direction and then took a left turn towards Ayurveda and, and what you're doing. Because it's really unique. Everybody here needs to, because I'll be honest, if a doctor looked at me and said that I had some kind of serious heart problem, I would not be running to Ayurveda hospital. I honestly, that's not me. So how, what are you doing? Tell us what you're doing. Uh, basically, I had done my MBBS in the year uh, 1999, I passed out. Before I entered in my MBBS, my father had already thought about going into Ayurvedic field for me. I was a topper in surgery, I was supposed to go for a MS surgery uh, and uh, I had a call from my father that you don't have to go for this seat, you just have to come down and get your Ayurvedic uh, things done. So I was back to Mumbai and uh, I started with the same things. Slowly and gradually things evolved, being an uh, allopathy lover, I always uh, tried to intervene into things slowly and gradually when I entered into Ayurveda, I entered into a specialty field of it. My father had a good practice of cardiology, then I developed interest in cardiology. I entered into it, I found that uh, reinventing the wheel, going back to allopathy and coming up with something new. Instead of that, we have a good base of patients over here, we have a good uh, set of knowledge over here, uh, set of principles laid down. I just had to mix up allopathic principles with Ayurvedic therapies. So that was the easiest thing that I would have done and I tried to go for it and this is where I am right now. Uh, in the year 2006, uh, we built up our first hospital that was near Mumbai, say about 50 kilometers away from Mumbai. Uh, that was a three acre space and it was a huge challenge. People had advised me not to go for it. But I was very clear about it that whatever I'm doing, I'm very clear about it. I will be succeeding in it because I knew the potential of uh, cardiologic uh, things happening in the world. I was uh, going through a number of websites of the US and UK uh, websites in which cardiac rehabilitation was a huge uh, thing which was coming up. 
so i could sense that that this is the field that is going to boom up tomorrow so why not to get into it then i developed the whole center as a cardiac rehabilitation center i initially uh, called up people for rehabilitation purpose slowly and gradually when we came to know that yes this is booming good and this therapy is working good to improve the patients who don't even want to go for surgeries also then we came up with the whole novel idea of asking patients to come down for preventing their surgeries also um as you said you are absolutely right uh, maybe about 90% people yet don't believe on us that we will be treating them completely and reversing their heart disease but that 10% crowd is also so huge for us that we are not able to deal with them also at the present uh, scale that we have we have a chain of about 137 clinics and two hospitals all over maharashtra and uh, uh as you said uh, people don't believe because they don't believe in the concept that uh, heart disease like thing can be treated through ayurveda it can be treated without surgery but it is surely possible to treat because it's a lifestyle disease uh, it's a non communicable disease and reversal of that some lifestyle changes good amount of exercise some diet control and uh, some ayurvedic panchakarma procedures along with uh, dietitian's advice physiotherapy uh, guidance and these things can be reversed to a very good level normally what happens is people normally when they think of heart disease they think of blockages they think of heart attack but uh, heart disease is something more than that because uh, there are few things in which uh, there is prevention there is curation there is rehabilitation so there is a vast field as such where you can work in cardiology i think we are working only 10% of it uh, right now in the whole cardiology section as such so uh, i think uh, yes people don't believe in us right now but i am very sure that in the coming days when we are trying to prove ourselves to the research papers in lancet in world cardiology congress we have presented our research papers in which we have see, shown that the treatment really works uh, yes people have started believing in us we were uh, uh, in the earlier uh, years we uh, were on the wrong uh, road as such where we were trying to portray ourselves as an ayurvedic thing ayurvedic thing hence people did not believe in us but now we have started rebranding ourselves in uh, multidisciplinary like of thing in which now the acceptance level has started initially uh, increasing to a very good level so i'm sure that in the coming next 5 uh, 7 years we'll be doing absolutely good as we go ahead but well, you have a few slides do you want to show that now do you feel like it's um, good it would be the same as such i'll try same. to speak about that in 2 minutes itself without the slide okay itself. well there is one stat on the slide that in 2020 in india is going to lead the world in something can you talk uh, about that and that's yes. what you're building so you now you're prototyping you're going through these cycles getting ready for an onslaught of us in the room to be running to you probably right um as per the new 2020 yes. tell us what's happening uh, as per who uh, it has already been uh, predicted that in 2020 india would be the capital of heart disease uh, maximum number of heart patients would be available in india as you know india is already a capital of diabetes every uh, three patients one would be uh, every three people one would be a diabetic uh, if you go to a age uh, beyond 40s so uh, and every second diabetic is going to be a heart patient so you can just imagine what is going to be the gravity of heart disease in the coming days so people whether they believe they don't believe they are going to join up with some other therapy either they go on for angioplasties and bypass people and if at all you see in india uh, the cost of angioplasty bypass is uh, comparatively very high to uh, what people can afford uh, if at all people don't afford the invasive therapies they have to do something uh, hence we would be the best option that people would be looking out for uh, if at all uh, the slight thing it will i like to tell we are beginning with a campaign called as arogyam hruday sampada in which uh, we'll be uh, conducting 6000 awareness events all over maharashtra and reaching 3 lakh patients uh, senior citizens to be more very precise 3 lakh patients in the year as well we'll be offering about a lakh stress test free of cost to the senior citizens so that is a huge thing that we'll be doing in this year in which we'll be uh, spreading ourselves into those people we'll be asking them to come down get a stress test done screen themselves because the maximum prevalence of heart disease is seen in the age group 50 to 
So if at all we can deal in over there with those patients, we can increase the mortality uh, the survival ratio and reduce on the mortality ratio. A small research that we had done in our uh, uh, setup of 137 clinics and two hospitals, the data was saying something like that, that if at all angioplasty and bypass have a survival ratio of about say 73-74%, we do have an equivalent survival ratio of about say 80%. Now we are taking a challenge of increasing the survival ratio to about 90%. Whether it's possible or not, time is going to help us uh, to see that ahead. But I'm very sure that if at all we increase the amount of uh, care that we give towards the patient, uh, if at all we increase the amount of uh, uh, expertise that we put, if at all we increase the amount of attention that we give to the patient, 101% the mortality ratio can be brought down and senior citizens, 50 to 70 years of age, they can enjoy their life in a very good fashion. And what I think everybody needs to understand the, the art and the science, even the business modeling is everything that Dr. Rohit just said, there's probably three dozen verticals of business businesses, uh, crores and crores of rupees in what he just said right now. So we can, we can dissect that later on. I want to move on to Saurav. Um, he just set you up really well, <laughs> right? With, with uh, being the diabetic capital of the world and cardiology um, uh, problems. Now, you have started a venture a few years ago in that space. Can you tell us a little bit about that and then um, give, you have a unique perspective in terms of how um, we can be disruptive in healthcare and I want you to get to that in just a minute. But tell us what you're doing right now with uh, sparse nephrocare and what the problem you're solving and where the business opportunities lies. And then we'd like to hear a little bit more about the disruptive um, uh, thoughts you have. As uh, Dr. Rohit mentioned, uh, India is the capital of diabetes already. And uh, one of the things that happens after diabetes and hypertension is kidney failure. Uh, so me and my partner, we both uh, just chanced upon this that India has about uh, 20 lakh people with uh, kidney failure but uh, only around uh, two, uh, and two lakh get added to this pool every year. But the number of people who are undergoing dialysis therapy, which is a, like, you need it, it's a life-saving therapy, there are only 50,000 to 75,000 patients who are doing it. And the big question is why? Just by chance we got into this and uh, we started this company looking just at this number. As he mentioned also rightly, when somebody asks me what about your competitors, I always say that, that even if you know, there are 20 competitors, uh, the rate at which uh, these non-communicable diseases are increasing and the rate at which kidneys are failing, even if 20 of companies start solving for it, we each of us will be worth like 500 crores, 1,000 crores and still not be able to solve it. So there's nothing about competition in healthcare that way. Uh, so we start talking to people why this is happening, why the very few people are undergoing dialysis. And the first answer that everybody tells you is that because they cannot afford it, it's a very expensive therapy. Uh, I, uh, we totally get it uh, because you have to spend about 25, 30,000 rupees every month on this therapy. You have to undergo dialysis every second day or every third day. And the worst part is you don't get cured. It just maintains your health. Like you, uh, it doesn't cure your dialysis. Your kidneys don't recover. You have to keep doing dialysis uh, throughout your life. Uh, after talking to doctors and hospitals, we started talking to patients and we thought we heard something different. A lot of patients in Hyderabad, we sat in a hospital in Hyderabad and started asking patients, we realized that a lot of patients are coming from cities near Hyderabad, 80 kilometers, 100 kilometers, 150 kilometers. What they said is that, you know, the cost of dialysis is one thing, but it's the travel, and uh, they will get weak, so somebody has to accompany them. So he, there is a loss of pay involved of somebody who could have earned money. And then there is a lot of intangibles which people started saying like, you know, loss of willpower. People feel they're a burden on their family, the burden on society. And when you lose the willpower to survive, uh, that's a pretty difficult thing. Then uh, nobody can save the patient. When we started hearing this, we realized that's a big opportunity. The whole healthcare system in India is geared towards serving acute healthcare right now. If you want, if you need, uh, you're in need of a bypass or something, I think India has some of the best doctors, best infrastructure to deliver it. But when it comes to acute uh, uh, chronic care, because the patient has to travel again and again, what in India has happened is that there are few cities which are concentrated with very high-end healthcare service delivery uh, infrastructure, and people have to keep coming there. And this is this works perfectly fine when it comes to acute healthcare. If you want to get a heart surgery done or a knee transplant done, you can just travel once in a while and get it done and you are cured. But 
things need to change. You have to think differently when it comes to something like dialysis. And you have to take the therapy right next to the patient. And that was our idea. We started dialysis centers in these tier two towns in India. So we have centers in cities like Mahbub Nagar, in Miryal Goda, in Tirupati, in Karnool, Anantapur, Chittur. And there are a lot of patients there, a lot of patients. And uh, the key problem was, how do you make sure you need a super specialist nephrologist to deliver uh, you know, the initial care required to the patient? How do you make the nephrologist deliver his care in these places? Because there are very few of them in India. So invest in uh, IT to make sure that there can be remote consultation possible. Uh, they should be able to see patient trends while not having to go to the patient. Then we started, um, somebody had mentioned skill power, uh, semi-skilled labor. India has uh, lack of that. Uh, you know, you can invest as much money as you want, but uh, the growth in this sector is the main bottleneck would be semi-skilled labor. We do not have enough paramedical staff in India. We have started our own training program, which churns out dialysis technician, so that we don't depend on market. We churn our own technicians, we staff them. So these are the few things we have done to take dialysis closer to the patient. And we have seen that the, uh, uh, the patients have become more compliant. People who were earlier traveling to Hyderabad once in a week are now traveling uh, to our center twice in a week. So that improves their uh, health and nicest. And how, how many, uh, can you give us numbers in terms of patients and number of dialysis you're doing and where you're trending towards? So we started um, uh, four years back and uh, uh, we now have 45 dialysis centers in uh, uh, Delhi, UP, Orissa, AP, Karnataka. We do more than 15,000 dialysis uh, every month. And um, uh, we are, uh, you know, we are looking at two things while we grow, uh, go forward. One is have more and more dial centers, keep adding, uh, uh, re uh, try to reach 100 dial centers as quickly as possible. But also at the same time, we are looking at his model where uh, he has two hospitals, right? We right now only do dialysis. So we are looking at setting up few renal centers, complete renal care centers, where we will actually, we have a huge patient pool now who are on dialysis. And they need a lot of other care for which they go outside our system. We don't want that to happen because we do not have any control of the quality there. So we want to capture all that value. And going forward, we want to set up some renal centers and serve as many patients as possible. Knowing the healthcare trends, the investment facts or investment theses, I'm sure you can spend an hour on the internet, we can get them. I think what is very crucial is uh, the passion of the founder and his background, gelling, I think is very crucial to make this happen. So I think, uh, suppose someone with a big data background, if you want to start a hospital, it will be catastrophe. But uh, someone with a big data background, if he has a passion for healthcare, there may be an opportunity. For example, the IBM spent maybe billions of dollars on trying to find, the, it's called, the program is called Watson. Watson and they probably must have fed maybe a million records of patients with various types of cancers. And then the computer, supercomputer will tell what drug, drug combinations would be beneficial. However bright that medical oncologist is, and we have guidelines, this particular disease, cancer, this particular cell type of cancer, these are the drugs. But there will be so many variables, patient's age or sex, other confounding factors, uh, stage of the cancer. So to put all of them variables together and select a drug is impossible. So if someone with a passion for cancer, if father died of cancer, or brother died of cancer, or spouse died of cancer, and if he's from big data, he should look into that kind of an opportunity. And I think uh, the person's background, and his passion, probably I'm sure there are enough opportunities. Obviously, if you want to ask one question would be the wearable devices, yeah. but whether we can make it successful, I'm sure there'll be thousand startups in this world already working on it, yeah. but I'm sure one will succeed. Yeah. Uh, whether they can beat Apple, Apple or Samsung, still come out, uh, but that's a big bet. I think what do. Apple has done recently with the iWatch, I don't know if the iWatch will become successful, but there's a company, and I, I've spotted a few in India that I feel can come behind that momentum sure. that they've opened up, because they've opened up everybody's eyes to 
the product and now somebody has to come in and I think there are some companies in India. Yeah, so wearable devices is one, it's a bright angster, yeah. the cute. Uh, we just don't know which one yet. Yes. Right? <laughs> Thank you guys for being open and transparent and not pontificating. And uh, I think everybody appreciates the transparency that they saw and heard from you guys today. Uh, thank you all. Thanks a lot.